Okay, so um, we are in a series, uh, and the series is called Wisdom. Um, and this is, t- today is our last day in the series. And um, next week we'll, we'll start with, with something new again. Um, God's kind of been speaking to my heart regarding it. I can't tell you yet exactly what it is, but I really believe, um, I think it's a direction where he wants us to go. Um, so wisdom. Uh, next, okay, we, the, ne- the next series is called Happy. Okay, so because I do think, a lot of people think God doesn't want us happy. Uh, I've actually heard a message where, where somebody said, God's not interested in your happiness. He's interested in your holiness. You know how contradicting that is? You know how, how that statement is one of the most contradicting statements you can make? Because holiness means I'm set apart for God. So if you set apart for God and you're not happy, you might be set apart for the wrong one. Right? Check your salvation. Make sure you set apart for a good father. Right? Because God wants us happy. Um, and we've been reading, blessed is the man. And, you know, and there's so many incredible, um, you know, in Matthew, when Jesus speaks, he speaks about the blessed, the blessed, you know, blessed is the meek, blessed is the poor in spirit, blessed. And all those blessed means happy. God wants us to be happy, but his principles he's teaching us. And, and how many of you, um, like, I, I am honestly, I'm a happy guy. I am. Um, I, I am happy because I'm, I'm in God's plans and purposes for my life, which causes me to have the outward result of what's happening on the inside and of what he's doing. And I want that to be something that we are known for. I want us to be known as a people that are happy, filled with joy. Like I told our teens this morning, when you serve, you are serving people. So it means try to be happy. Like, try that smile. Give them a smile. It's important for us. So, so we're in, that was just a little bit of wisdom found in Proverbs. Um, so we're in, in wisdom, and this is the last week, and, and we've looked at quite a few different things. And I feel that this week I, I kept, um, I actually prepared this message in week two already, but I kept postponing it because I feel this is one of the most important things that I can teach you from the book of Proverbs. Um, it's one of the most, most revealing things that you will find in your life. If you want to change and impact your life, if you apply this principle of wisdom in your life, your life changes. Um, we, we read... Um, In Romans, our theme, one of our theme topics has been, um, and do not be conformed to the images of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you are able to prove what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God, right? We know that, how many of you know the scripture by heart by now? This is a good one because this is constantly something that I'm reminding myself of on a daily basis. I want to prove what is the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to be able to do that. So we are not going to be conformed to this world, but we will be transformed by the renewing of our thinking, which means we are going to get God's wisdom in our lives to change and impact our lives so that we can have fruit that proves to the world that we are set apart. We are different. There's something different in us. We're not just the similar to everybody else. And, and this is how we prove. Um, most of the time, it is by our fruit. And this, this tree is the fruit of somebody who's living a life for Christ. This is the fruit that God wants us to have in our lives. Now, I do not know a person that has just these fruits. Uh, I don't. It is something that we are all continually renewing our minds in so that we can be transformed in every area of our lives so that our lives will resemble just the fruit that he has. But it all starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. So unless you change your roots, the roots who you are planted in, the one that you are serving, the one who's got the, the primary, the, the, the say in your life, the one that has the, the head role in your life, unless you move from being, uh, and it's, it's a challenge for all of us, being double standard. It's almost like we, we are um, dual rooted, like we, we rooted on the one side in Christ because we're Christians, but we're still living in the world. So in many of our lives, there's many areas where we're still rooted in what the world says regarding us, regarding situations, regarding circumstances, regarding things that's right and wrong, morality. So, so we kind of have the, our, our feet kind of in both of them. And, and the effect of having our feet in both of them means the fruit at the top is going to not exactly look just like that. And it's almost like we have to take every area of our lives and pull it out of the world and what the world is saying regarding and planting it in Christ. Every error, everything that you must be, that you're struggling with, everything that you're going through, that has to be uprooted and planted, uprooted and planted so that our lives will eventually become 
love, um, joy, peace, riches, peace, length of days, um, healthy relationships, a future, kindness, healthy homes, generosity, grace, joy. We want our lives to become the fruit that proves that God is good. We want that to be something that comes out of us. Um, last week I spoke about vision and Ermi said to me, it sounded like, I, she said it, it felt the whole time like I was angry. I said, I'm, I, I hope it didn't come across like I was angry because I wasn't angry. It was supposed to be passion. <laughs> yeah, I get that mixed up all the time also. It's the same as competing and being over, uh, it's not a characteristic that I have, being over competitive. Right, it's something that I am taking out of this world and putting into this one. It's a process, right? Some things are deeply rooted and we have to get them out. But here's the reality. I said last week, God only works in the light. And I love the fact that in Genesis, and this was me like revealing, and before God did anything, before he started forming the earth, uh, the separating the water, making the trees, making man, making the animals, the first thing he did, he said, let there be light. God wants us to have light and he wants us to have vision for our lives. Now this tree, uh, let's just go back one more. Sorry, this tree should be vision for your life. The Bible and the instruction we get about the incredible fruit, that is vision. God's given you vision. You don't have to be at a place where you, well, I guess I'm just stuck with this anger. I guess I'm just stuck with this depression. I guess I'm just stuck with this sickness or disease. Or I guess I'm just stuck in this terrible relationship. I guess I'm just stuck it. You don't have to be stuck there. God is giving you light. He's shining light on your life so that you can have vision to bring a difference. Change it. Change the fruit. So God works in revelation. He does not work in darkness. So in order for you to bring light and to bring change into the situations and into the fruit that you want to see change in your life, bring God's light into it. Okay, I'm struggling with anger. God, I'm going to start bringing light into those areas where I'm struggling with. I'm going to start reading the scriptures regarding patience and kindness and gentleness. I'm going to start practicing those areas of patience and kindness and gentleness. And what's going to happen is light will overtake the darkness. Darkness cannot withstand the light. It's impossible. Whatever you've been dealing with, it is impossible for it to withstand the light. It cannot Okay, so, so that for me was, was something that, that I felt was really, it's so important. Have vision. Have vision for whatever, whatever you're going through. It, even for your future. It doesn't have to be just things that you're struggling with. Have vision for your future. Have vision for where God wants to take you um, as a couple, as, as maybe somebody, your children have just left the, left the home. What's the vision for your, for your lives now? For somebody who's retired, don't have the vision just to say, I've retired, I'm going to do nothing now. That's not vision. That, that's, God wants to use you. Have vision for your life. We have vision for this church. Have vision how you're going to be involved in this. Have vision for our young people. Have vision for, for our community group that gathers at neighbors. Get, ask God for vision for your life, and it will impact you. Um, if you see nothing, you will be nothing, right? If you see wrong, you will be wrong. And if you see what God wants you to see, you will be what God wants you to be. Without vision, without light, God will show you. I remember for me, I was um, about 20 years old. I, I've, I started studying at that point uh, accounting, sports science, criminology, acting. Um, I st- yeah, I started all of those. I didn't finish any of them. But hey, if you don't start, you never know. Um, And then um, throughout all of this, I was seeking for purpose, seeking where God wants me to go. What's his purpose for my life? What does he want me to do? And and then um, my life changed. And I met God for the first time in my life. My real relationship with God began. I knew a lot about him because I grew up in a Christian home. Knew all the scriptures, knew a lot of scripture, knew the Bible really well. My life changed, went to church, met God, encountered him. And after that, I figured, okay, Now I have to figure out what God wants me to do. 
because God for the first time became, became real in my life. So I decided I'm going to do a fast. Okay, I'm going to fast. I'm going to take a tent. I'm going to go down to a, um, we call them dams um, in South Africa. You call them lakes, but it's a dam in South Africa. It's not like, oh, these, oh my, my damn knee. It's not one of those. It's like, actually, it's like a pool. It's a big, we don't have as big lakes as you have here. Um, I remember pitching my tent, making a little fire, have no food there, um, and just a Bible, the tent, me, and, th- and thought to myself, I'm going to stay here for three days. Right? Three days. I'm going to stay here for three days, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to sit here uh, for three days and just pray. And like most of you, after the first hour, I fell asleep. <laughs> Yeah, I lasted an hour. It was incredible. Um, but I remember just saying that the whole, the whole purpose of this was me saying, God, I'm serious about hearing what you've got to say. I am serious about what you want me to do with my life. So throughout this process, I lasted two days. I thought at, at day two, God spoke. I thought, okay, it's all done. Who's day three for? So <laughs> right? he spoke it to me. So why do I have to hang around you anymore? But I remember being in this tent and 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 reading the Bible, and then just waiting and saying, God, speak to me. Give me vision for my life. Give me vision for what you want me to be, where you want me to go. What are you calling me into? And what was quite, quite amazing is at that point, um, without knowing really what all these things mean, God showed me, listen, so he showed me this massive, almost like a pirate ship boat, um, those big boats, you know, the old wooden ones. And, and he said to me, you Moses. I said, well, Moses parted the sea. He didn't need a boat. Um, and they said, but I'm calling you into the office of Moses. I'm calling you to lead lost people into the promised land. He said, that's the calling that I've got on your life. So go and equip yourself. And the boat is always in, if, if you, if you um, go into the pr- prophetic ministry, you know that, that when God speaks of a boat, if he shows you a vision of the boat, it's, it means ministry. He calls you into ministry. And God called me into a ministry of, of not necessarily being an evangelist, of getting people to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, but helping people to understand that accepting Christ, the Jewish people, they were already God's nation. They were already his people. But they didn't understand that there was more to just being his people and still remaining slaves. He called them into a promised land where, where, where a land is filled with fruit that is visible, where people look at them and they go, wow, who's your God? People looked at the nation of Israel and went, who's your God? He's mightier than all of ours. He's more powerful. Look at the fruit of your grapes. Look at your cantaloupes. Look at your watermelons. Look at your your olives, your trees. Everything is greater than any other nations. And the reality is God is calling us as a body to depart from Egypt, every area of Egypt, of slavery. Whatever you are a slave to still, God is calling you into the promised land of his fruit. So it was through vision that my life changed. And I went into Bible school, and I studied for three years Bible school. And, and I went into ministry for, for about nine months. And then <laughs> things changed. And because I had to pay for my own Bible school, I had to start singing in, in restaurants. And I had a buddy who could play guitar. I couldn't play guitar at all. And I said to him, hey, I know about 10 songs. Can you play these 10 songs? And he said, yes. So we went to a restaurant and said, okay, we've got 10 songs. Um, would you pay us? To play here. He said, well, depends on how you sing and how you perform, right? Um, otherwise, you have to pay me if you chase them away. So, so we started singing, and we did our 10 songs. And after the 10 songs, the place just got fuller and fuller and fuller. And eventually, I did that for 12 years. Not in the same spot, but um, at different places. And God opened up music for me in such a way. But all of it was, throughout this whole process, I'm like, God, what are you doing in my life? What? And I never left God. But God was saying, these are all building blocks towards the vision that I have for your life. I'm teaching you how to speak to thousands of people. I'm teaching you how to feel comfortable with a microphone in your hand and not be nervous when I'm going to use you. I'm teaching you skills regarding when we started NUMA, um, I... I ran the sound, we ran the lights, I would do the praise and worship, sing, 
listen to how the band was going, run to the back, change the sound quickly, come back to the front, listen to it. And these were all skills that God placed in me for a time like this because there was a call and a vision in my life for what he wanted to do, which is I'm going to use you to take people from captivity into a place, not just salvation, but into the promised land, which is the fruit that God wants him to have in their lives. That's God's vision that he gave me. Am I his favorite? Yes. You should all say that. You are all his favorite. He loves every single one of you. He has a plan and a purpose for every single one of you. He doesn't go, okay, I'm going to pick him and pick him. And some people think that God is going to pick some people out. No, he's picked every single one of us. The word says that he died for the whole world. We have to choose him. And when we do choose his ways, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have access to wisdom. We have access to vision because he works. He cannot work in the darkness. Without Christ, your vision will never be what God created you to be. It is impossible. It's only when the light shines in your life that you are able to become what he's called you to be. Okay, so so here's our tree again. Here's some more fruit from the tree. Um, and, and the next slide, if you can go to, please, Corinne. I want you to hear me. God did not call Israel out of slavery into deeper slavery. God said, I heard the cry of my people. And I've prepared a place for them. Land of milk and honey. This is, I heard the cry of my people and I prepared a place for them. A land of dungeons and uh, droughts and hunger. How many of you want to go? No. He said, I prepared a place for you that is prosperous. And you know how prosperity shows in your life? It shows by having the fruit of Jesus Christ present. It shows through love. If you have love, if you are loving people, you are a prosperous man. You are a prosperous woman. Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, patience, humility, hope, trusting, encouraging, uplifting, knowledgeable, understanding, compassionate, success, healthy relationship, legacy, inheritance, influence towards life. That is a prosperous person. God is calling you into being prosperous in every one of those areas, which is amazing. He wants us to be a prosperous people. Prosperity means I have enough to give out of it. I, can, I have enough love to give love out. I have enough joy to give joy to you. I have enough peace to be peaceful with you, to be patient with you. I have enough humility so that I don't have to boost myself or, or lift myself up to feel greater. Actually, my humility, what I will do is I will boost you. I will lift you up. I will encourage you. I've got so much. I'm so prosperous in these areas. I'm going to influence your life with every single one of them. I want to be that prosperous. That's the fruit I want us to have as a body. Now, we are in the process of renewing our minds because it says, do not be conformed to the images of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you are able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, so we are in the process of changing our thinking because for many of us, our thinking is not, this is me being prosperous. We're on the process of changing our thinking regarding our situations, right? right? Anger, it's just a family thing. We are all angry. I'm in the process of saying I am uprooting that anger and I'm, de- I'm planting it in Christ. We are in the process of changing our thinking regarding unforgiveness and offense and, and bitterness and jealousy. We're in the process of changing our thinking, of understanding I don't have to be like that. It's not who I have to be for the rest of my life. Right? We're in the process of it. But, but here's the thing. In order for us to bring change, we have to understand that... There's, there's a key that God's given us to, bring, to do this, this uprooting, to, to change this root system. He's given us ways to do it. And, and this is what I feel is probably for me the, the revealing thing that I found in Proverbs. 48 verses in Proverbs speaks in regards to this. 48 verses. Proverbs is divided into seven sections. It's, it's actually written, um, well, it's fantastically written. The last two chapters wasn't written by Solomon. Um, but 
the first 29 is written by Solomon. And they, there's different sections. The first part makes you in awe of who God is and understanding that you can trust him, that he's greater than you. His ways are better than your ways. The second part is just wisdom towards life, wisdom towards raising children, parenting, relationships, family, finances, health, um, relations with other people, relations with your enemy in a conflict. It's like it gives us all this incredible insight. Proverbs is a book and in, throughout all this section, Section one, section two, from section one to section seven, in every single one of them, this principle that, that I'm going to teach you this morning is in every single one of them. Being aware of God's power, fearing, he talks about fearing God. That, that fear is not, ah, oh, I'm scared, right? It's not like um, I'm going to squash you, right? It's not that kind of fear, like you little bug, right? It's not, uh, right? Everybody gets what I mean. It's like you're scared. It's not that kind of fear. The fear is an honest, being, being in admiration, um, being in, in respect and honor and, and value. And, oh, you, I value your opinion more than my opinion. I trust you. When you say it, it's done. It's having that confidence when, when you know people like that in your life, right? He said it. It has to happen. I'm hoping it's if you're a dad. And a mom, I'm hoping it's like that for your children. My dad said it. It's that, it's that honor and that respect of knowing if my dad said it, it's going to happen. It's that mindset that God wants us to have. And throughout that whole process, every section, he, he talks about this principle. Um, I'm going to start with it in 1 Peter 3. Um, the scripture says that the following, Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lip, lips from deceitful speech. In Proverbs, he says it this way. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Love that principle. I'm going to read you a lot of scriptures today. So, so we're going to read a lot of scriptures. I'm going to go through them quickly. Because I think it's important for you to hear from the Bible directly about how important God says our lips our words, our mouths are in our lives. Um, the, the topic is, if you change your roots, you have to change your words. Listen, if you're telling me that you are changing your roots regarding whatever situation you are talking about, whatever you are going through, don't tell me, yeah, I believe God is really doing something in this area. And then the next moment you give the devil glory for still holding you. No, if you're changing your roots, you have to change your words. You have to change your lips. You have to change your speaking. Because it is a principle in God's word. This principle for Solomon was in every section of life, this principle is valuable. There's not an area in your life that will not be influenced and changed if, if you don't change this. Your speech. Our words are critical. It's important. It's our success or it's our failure. And our successes and our failures will be determined by our words more than any other factor in our lives. Do you understand that? Your successes and your failures are determined more by your words than any other area in your life, any other thing. It's your words determines your successes and your failures. In Proverbs 18, 20, it says, A man's stomach shall be satisfied by the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat the fruit of it. Now, I've got, I've got the tree here again, and I went, went um, um, Irish with it, because that's really what St. Patrick Day is, is Irish, not Scottish. Scottish is blue, right? Brave old freedom, right? Different one. Okay. Irish. Okay. So Christmas tree. So now on the Christmas tree here, I still have all the good fruit. We anchored in Jesus Christ. Because we anchored in Jesus Christ, he gives us wisdom. That wisdom is not just for us to go, hmm, I'll think about that every day. No, that wisdom is for you to change your speaking, to align with what the relationship with Jesus Christ 
guarantees you, promises you. So, so now I've got wisdom. Because I have wisdom, God said, the same way he said to Solomon, I will give you everything. Everything in your life can change if you have wisdom. But that wisdom has to affect your speaking. It's not just for your head. Now, now we've got this tree over here, and we've got love, and we, under love we've got anger. And we've got prosperity, and we've got self-centeredness. And we've got loneliness, and we've got healthy relationships. And like, in our lives, we have this tree. We, we have life, and we have people who struggle with depression. We have, have um, peace, and we have people who are anxious, anxiety. And they believe us. They love God. They've got incredible relationships with God. Now, we can go, like many other churches or believers or charismatic movements or whatever else has done in the past, go and Bible bash them and say, hey, just, just, just believe it. You just have to believe it. Right? It's, it's, you know, uh, where's your faith? Get stronger faith. The reality is God never says that. He never says, go to other believers and hit them with the Bible and judge them and condemn them so they will feel guilty for the fruit that is not reflecting him yet. We are not called. Remember I said last week, the church is not called to remind people of their sin. The church is called to remind people that God remembers their sins no more. So if I remind you that God remembers your sins no more, what am I going to speak into your life? Instead of saying, hey, you're struggling with anxiety, I'm going to start telling you. And I'm going to start confessing God's peace and God's trust trust in God's love and God's care for you. You are fearfully made. He knows who you are. Your whole life is in front of him. He looks at every area of it. You can trust him. He's not standing in the moments going, oh my goodness, what are we going to do now? He's looking at your life and he says, listen, I've got every place, every set. There is ways of wisdom for you to conquer this thing. But now we're still struggling. So now I've, I've got life or I've got peace, but I'm supposed to have peace, but I have an anxiety. So what do I do now? A man's stomach shall be satisfied by the fruit of his mouth. A man's life shall be satisfied by the fruit of his mouth. So what am I going to do? I'm going to start taking this area of this fruit that's in my mouth because I'm currently seeing the signs of it. I'm anxious. I'm going to take the signs of what I'm seeing and I'm going to start to satisfy my body with what Jesus Christ says I'm supposed to satisfy it with and speak his life into my Does it mean it's going to change immediately? You know, God has done miracles in the Bible. We find so many miracles where it happened instantly. Jesus was there. We know of people who are instantly healed, instantly touched, lives changed. Fantastic. But the majority of the people, and by that, by majority, I mean 99.9% .9 of the people, God is in relationship with. He's working with you at your pace. He's not forcing you. I said he's not in a sausage machine where he's trying to grind us all through the pipe at the other end at the same time. We are all dealing with separate things, different things in different ways. His power is real. His word is real. His word is truth. It will impact your life. But it will impact your life not necessarily the same time frame as mine. And that's okay. It's okay if you don't get the revelations all at once. It's okay if you don't get your healing immediately. It's okay if you're not set free immediately. It's okay. But as long as you are in the process of saying, God, I am affecting this by renewing my thinking to align with yours. It's okay as long as you don't give up on saying, I'm not happy with the fruit. It's okay if you're at that place where you're saying, I know these fruits, I'm not satisfied with that fruit. When it's not okay is when you go, I guess that's just the fruit that's going to be in my life. That's not okay. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to change our thinking. We are called to be teachable. We're called to l search for wisdom, apply wisdom. Why? Because God wants to use your life. Most of the time, that area that you are struggling in will become the area where your ministry will flourish in. Because you went through that process. Don't give up on the things that you know is not from God. Even if you failed, it's okay. We're going to do it again. We're going to keep adding that word to our life. We're going to keep taking the roots out of the world's side of that's just life. Into no, I am set 
apart from the world to have life differently than the world. Many people are satisfied by keeping those things in their lives because it's hard to change them. It is hard. Would you lose your salvation? No, you don't. Are you any less his son or daughter? No, you're not. But it's up to you to decide, do I want to live in all of it or not? It's your choice. But I want you to know God loves you. I want you to know that he's powerful. I want you to know that his plans and his dreams and his vision for your life is amazing. And I want you to know that you can trust him. He hasn't given up. He's not going, okay, we tried this three times. He's not there. He knows what he can do through you and with you. It means if you understand the positive power of your mouth, you could live in the fruit, the fruit of, of, for your relationship, of, of what you, you are saying. You can live in that fruit. I have an amazing relationship with my wife. An amazing, why? Because the fruit from my lips about my relationship with her and about her, I will never say anything bad about her about our relationship. And, and I, I can't. Honestly, I can't. Why? Because the fruit from both our lips are honoring and respectful and uplifting and loving and caring. It's the fruit from our lips. Are we just greater people than other people that we have a greater relationship? Yes. No, just checking who's listening. <laughs> no, we're not. But, but I know, I've seen it. I've seen it in my children. I've, I've seen people saying, you know, yeah, you're going to have to watch out when your girls get older, you know, yeah, teenagers. No, nonsense. Your teenagers can do that, not mine. Mine will be honoring and respectful. They will love God. They will respect people. They will be kind. There's no, not going to be any funny mood swings. You can have that for your home if you want that. I don't. Right? It's your choice. You can choose. And why? Because it's the way we are teaching them, the way we are interacting with them, what we're believing about them, the way our conduct is with them, the way we treat them, the way they see us treating each other, treating other people. It, and not accepting nonsense. There's nonsense. People, I, I, hear, I hear nonsense a lot. And I say to people, that's nonsense. That's not the fruit that God has for your life. But if you keep saying it, I'm telling you, you're busy producing. Like you're rolling out the crates full of it. So you can decide what crates you want to. And I caught myself regarding my son, um, if everything goes well, and, and I believe they will, it, it will. He has to go into academy next year, hockey academy. That's $18,000 a year for a 13-year-old. Yeah. So if anybody wants to make donations, it's welcomed. No. So, no. so I said to Henry, yeah, how are we going to afford this? Like, how are we gonna, like, it's not like I can preach an extra message on a Sunday and say, hey, let's see if I can get an extra income. I'm going to have three services this week because I need, I, it's not, I don't, it's, it's not that you can generate. But I said to you, you know, do we trust that this is God's path for his life? Yes, it is. So first I doubt it. Oh, I don't know how we're going to do this. It's going to be impossible. No idea how this is going to happen. Oh, we're going to have to find alternatives. Like how many kidneys do you still have, right? Two? Yeah, well, I know what we can get for one of them, right? So <laughs> starting to make plans on what we can do. And, and then I caught myself stopping and saying, no, are we trusting this is God's path for his life? We both in agreement. Yes, it is. We know God will provide for us. Why? Because we are faithful with our tithe. We, we, we believe in his principles. We apply them to our lives. And besides that, the fruit that's in our lives has never, ever been where God has placed something in our hearts and he hasn't provided. Never. 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 Why would I doubt now? So I caught myself saying, I'm going, I don't want to produce that nonsense. Because the more I speak it, you know, the more what happens? Anxiety, stress, condemnation. Oh, I feel so guilty that I can't send my son where I want him to go. What comes in? Fear. Oh, he's going to miss out. Then what happens? Stress. Then what happens? We get bogged down with anxiety and, and, and just overworked and everything else. 
doesn't mean I don't have responsibility. I do have responsibilities. But what I'm doing is I'm saying, God, I know that you've got a path for my son. I'm opening up my eyes. I'm, I'm willing to work. I work hard. I've got no problem with it. I know you're going to give me the opportunities. I'm looking forward to how you're going to provide. I'm not scared of it. And it's the same for you. You might be in debt now and you're thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to get out of this debt? What are we going to do? Look forward to God's provision. Start speaking it. Start saying, God, I will take every opportunity where you open the door, even if it is that I have to put $5 aside at a time. Because to most of us, the way we like to pay off debt, all. That would be really great. If I can find a job, I can pay all of it at once. That would be fantastic. Amen? <laughs> that would be great. Um, no, but, but understand, it means that if, if I'm going to follow God's wisdom and direction, He's going to say to me, listen, Andreas, what I want you to do is, you and your family are going to eat out less. Uh, how much less? No, not at all. Okay. For a season. Uh, okay, I want you, Andreas, I'm going to give you wisdom. Listen, um, you're going to sell your truck because it's too expensive on gas. You're going to buy a smaller one. Okay. You can start working with your property and your land. Yes, I will. Right? It's not just saying, okay, I'm, okay, I've prayed now. Remember what I said, what is provision? Remember, uh, so many people, God, we're praying for provision, provision, provision. God, just please provide. Remember, provision means for the vision. There cannot be provision unless there's vision. So I want provision for my son's future. God said, okay, so what is the vision? What are you willing to do? Where are you willing to go? God, you've given us, he's given us a plan. We've got a plan from him and we're applying it. And I'm excited about it. Or we can be depressed and have the opposite fruit. I choose not to have it because my lips will not speak those words. All good things flow from our words. But the power of life and death is in our tongue. We can kill relationships with our tongue. We can kill reputation with it. We can, we can build relationships or we can kill it. You can build your reputation or you can kill it. We have to be so wise with our words. You have to be so wise with what you tweet and what you Facebook and what you, I mean, it might be funny to you. But do you know that people are actually looking at your life? Especially if you put a Facebook thing on, Jesus saves, right? It's your first Facebook page for the morning and then by the afternoon, wish I could kill my boss. <laughs> right? But the morning, Jesus saves. So, uh, so what? Are you going to kill him because Jesus just saved him? You want him to get there quicker? Right? Be careful. And I'm, I'm, I mean, I just used very, because I have to be careful with my words. I just said so. Um, but... They, like, I, I, know, I know people, I, I have friends that are not here, that are, um, none of them are here right now, I'm not looking at anybody, um, <laughs> who put things on their Facebook pages and on their Instagrams and things that are not supposed to be out there from you. They're not. People are watching you. You have a reputation. You are busy building into people's lives. People, when they're going to go through difficulty, you are the one that they are supposed to come to. But because you just smell like them. Remember when I said the fish. Remember, I love fish. I love the story in the Bible of the fish. Um, um, what good is salt? If salt is of no good. It's only thing it's good for is to be thrown out on the street so that people can walk all over it. How did they know if salt was good? What do they use salt for? Preserve food in the Bible. Layer of salt, layer of fish, layer of salt, layer of fish, layer of salt, preserve food. How did they know if the salt was of no good? You are called the salt of the earth, you guys, all of us, salt of the earth. What, how did they know if the salt was good? They would taste it. If it tastes like salt, salt was good. If it tastes like fish, you're supposed to influence the fish. Not the fish influence you. Stop tasting like fish. Yeah. Listen, words are nuclear. Your words are nuclear in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. It has power. All words are consequential. There's no such thing, well, that's just an inconsequential, inconsequential word. We, we read in Matthew 12, it says, either make the tree good. Isn't it amazing how the, all these scriptures refers back to this tree that's rooted and planted? I hope you've got that picture of a tree in your life for a long time. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, 
or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit, brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? This is exactly right. So, so, so now you, you have these, these things that you say. You might be in a conversation around your buddies and you're just one of the guys and, and your language is the same as their language. And the next moment, oh, bless you. Bless you, brother. It's like, no, no. What, what is that bless you, brother stuff now? You were just cursing and swearing and everything else with everybody else talking bad about other people breaking people down and now suddenly bless you brother can i pray for you i don't want you to pray for me like you sound like i sound you smell like i smell he said you brood of vipers how can you speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks now out of the abundance now if we catch ourselves saying things that we don't want to say it means there are areas in our lives where our root system has still we acknowledge acknowledge where you are at acknowledge that there's roots here that i have to get out of the world and into jesus don't tell me i've been swearing my whole life i don't care i should be nicer in saying that because words are consequential i care I care that it might have been how you were for, the, for your whole life. But this is not how you're going to be for the rest of your life. Your words have power in the influence. You are called to influence this world. Our words are powerful. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Um, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bring forth good things. And an evil man out of the either treasures of his heart bring forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. And by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. By my words, I will be justified. What is my justification words that I'm going to choose? I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, right? By my words, I am condemned. I deny Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, okay? There's condemnation and judgment, okay? But this part, just before that, where we're speaking about um, every idle word that man speaks, your words are consequential. They count. They matter. They have an influence, maybe not on your salvation, because our, our mistakes are covered by the blood of Christ, but but. It has an influence on those listening, those reading, those looking, on looking, just standing on the side, looking at what you're doing, observing you. They're looking for people to change their lives. And they're hoping that it's you. Wait a minute. Here's, here's our tree again. So, so a man's stomach shall be satisfied by the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. So we have to change the fruit of our lips. And we get that from wisdom from God. We, we get that from God shining light, giving vision to the fruit that he wants in our lives. We get that from understanding that God has a purpose for our lives. We want to use us to influence the world. We get that, that, that these things that are wrong doesn't have to stay in my life. They can change. My, my life will be satisfied from my lips. Is your life being satisfied from your lips? And I can almost guarantee it. You can check every area of your life, what your lips are saying about it, because that's what it is. God wants us to have none of these red fruit. He just wants the green ones. They don't have to be there. God will not change your heart unless you allow him in and you apply his principles. The words that come from your mouth show the condition of your heart. A hateful heart means hateful words. Kind words means a kind heart. Loving words means a loving heart. You can tell the condition of another person's heart by listening to their words. Verse 36 is something very interesting. It says, but, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. Now some people go, oh, what's an idle word? For every idle word that a man speaks, they will give account of on the day of judgment. So what's an idle word? An idle word um, is that four-letter word you say in the garage when you hit your thumb and not the nail. That's an idle word. Idle words are words that, like I said, most of them are four letters, which is quite ironic. Golf is also four letters. 
I think it's, they, it, it was in the wrong category. Um, so so uh, it says that we will give to, we will be, there will be judgment on our idle words. So how does that work? Does God record all our words? Does he know every idle word that we say? I think God, I mean, he's God. He probably knows every word that we said. But it might be that there's like a, a little snitch angel following us around with a recorder, right? It's probably a female. And the reason why I say that is because she will not only tell you what you said, but she'll tell you what you wore when you said it. You were wearing that shirt with the flowers and the white stripes. I remember that very specifically. No, there's no female angels. I don't know why, but the Bible says no female angels. Um, But even if there was somebody following us and recording our words, the good news is once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and we're no longer planted in the world, means we no longer fall under the rules of the world. The rules of the world is every idle world you say will be condemned and judged. The rules in Jesus Christ is every idle word that you say because of the blood of Jesus Christ is forgiven. Does it give us freedom to just use them more freely? No, it actually encourages us to understand that we are loved so much that I want to change my life and my idle words and not say them anymore. Because I'm reflecting the one. I want to reflect the one that saved me. Remember I spoke regarding sin and, and God being outside of time. It's, this is your life, beginning of your life and the end of your life. Um, many of us think that, that, that God is just in time like we are. He's not in time. When I say God forgives your, your, your sin, when he looks at your sin, he looks at your sin uh, through Jesus Christ first of all. And he said, okay, Jesus Christ paid for all sin. So all sin is poured into one bucket. The whole world sin of all time poured into one bucket and it's forgiven. Now people have to decide if they want to apply that forgiveness, that blood that was shed on our behalf. The world has to decide if they want to apply it to their lives or not. If they apply it to their lives, they are forgiven. They're forgiven of their sins, all of it. Past, present, and future. Why past, present, and future? Because God is not in past, present, or future. He is. He's not just... Well, he started the day the earth was created and he's going to end the day the earth is destroyed. No, God is forever. So all sin for God is one thing, sin. That's why the scripture in John 16 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, if you are, um, it is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they do not believe in me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more, and of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I want to explain those three things. I'm going to have to end with it. Um, worship team, please come up. Um, so, so this is an important thing, and I'm nowhere close to where I want to be to the end of this, but, but I'll, I'll finish after this. This is so key for us to understand. I've had this scripture in here for seven weeks. And for seven weeks, I felt it hasn't been the right time to share it. Today is the last week, so I have to share it. Otherwise, I had it there for no reason. No, today I'm sharing it because I felt that this is the time for you to hear this. It says, and when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. Now, a lot of people struggle with that. He's going to convict the world of sin. This is daily. Daily he's going to convict us. Do you know what that sin there is? This sin here is not plural. It's, it's not... It's not um, your little mistakes. It doesn't mean the cursing, the swearing, murder, hatred. It doesn't mean the individual mistakes. It doesn't mean on a timely matter. There's a time frame in between it. That sin there is a singular sin. One sin. He's going to convict the world of one sin. The Holy Spirit, when he comes to us, he's convicting us of one sin. What is the one sin? They do not believe in me. Because the moment you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, all your sins have been dealt with. This is major. Because we keep thinking, I have to keep dealing with all my mistakes, fix all my mistakes, fix all my mistakes, fix all. Oh, the Holy Spirit's convicting me of sin again. No, 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 no. That is the enemy coming to you, keeping you in your old mindset, rooted in the old way of thinking. If you are in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, once He's convicted you of sin, what does He do? He convicts you of righteousness after. So He's convicting you of one sin. What is it, one sin? You have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Okay, next phase of the Holy Spirit. I am now going to convict you of righteousness. What does righteousness mean? 
right standing with God. So what is his conviction for me now? Now that I am in Jesus Christ, no longer rooted in the world, but now rooted in Christ. His conviction for my life now is the following. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Mark, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Mark, that was easy. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Genie. You are the right. It's not genie. You are a failure. What are you doing? You were thinking this morning again. How can you wear such an ugly shirt on stage? Like, <laughs> Ken, you were thinking the same thing. Stop it. <laughs> He's not convicting us of wrongful thoughts. He's convicting us of who we are. You are now planted and rooted in Jesus Christ. The conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life is you are in Jesus. Now those sins and those things that we are dealing with, what happens is when those temptations and those difficulties come and you step out of line, a lot of people think, yeah, it's the Holy Spirit telling you that you've done wrong. Listen, you don't need the Holy Spirit to tell you when you're doing stuff wrong. You, you know why? Because Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of, which means they gained knowledge of, good and evil you have knowledge of good and evil the Holy Spirit's not convicting you of that do you think the people in the Bible before the Holy Spirit was poured out over them didn't know what was right and wrong I'm gonna cut your throat off I don't know if that's right or wrong they knew now when the Holy Spirit comes and you do something wrong he comes to you and he says man son of God I've called you into righteousness you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The fruit of your life is love, joy, peace. The fruit of your life is healthy relationships, kindness, gentleness. The fruit of your life is patience. The fruit of your life is gentleness. Hey, you're a gentle man. Hey, your kindness is in you. Hey, forgiveness is in you. Hey, the, um, life is in you. It's not, hey, hey, um, stop being depressed. Hey, stop being anxious. Hey, why are you not trusting me? Hey, why is your faith so wrong? No, you have the faith of Christ in you already. You have the ability to do more things through Christ Jesus who lives in you than him who is in this world. You are victorious. Greater is he who is in you than he is in the world. You are the head, not the tail. You are the top, you are not the bottom. You are the victory, you're not the defeated. You are not the one that keeps foil. The way we see ourselves is we think the Holy Spirit just reminds us of our failures. He's not a reminder of failure. He's a reminder of the greatest success story that's ever been accomplished. Now that has to become the roots of our words. And as we submit every area of, my, of our live stream, here is the question that I have for you. Have you submitted your words to Him also? Because it will change and impact your lives in so many dramatic and drastic ways only for the better. But you have to say, God, I'm willing to submit my words to you. I will submit my lips to you. And when I find myself stepping out saying an idle word, I wanted to go through the... Um, 10 different things that he talks about are words that, that we have to be aware of, being aware of it, shining light on them, gossiping, slandering, um, lying, deceiving, um, bringing um, disorder, bringing disunity. So many things that we can do with our words. I wanted to, to bring light to them so that we can recognize them. Lights shine on them. So I want to see vision so that I can change the direction of them. But I'm not going to get there today. But I want you to understand that, that those things which you know your words is currently breaking down. Those are the areas where God is calling you to change your speech. Change your lips. Change your words. Change your root system in every area. Don't give up. Don't give in. Wisdom is available. It's available. Vision is available. Amen. Amen. Let's sing Amazing Grace.